From the financial centers of the world, this is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. It is 30 minutes into the U.S. trading day, Friday, October 20th. Here are the top market stories that we're following for you at this hour. Time to buy the dip? Well, Bank of America says sentiment so bad, it's now triggered a contrarian buy signal. So, time for the safety trade? Money flowing into bonds and gold. We're going to dissect the safety trade into the weekend. And time to sell solar. Solar Edge sinks. Customers cancel and delay orders. Inventory piles up. The stock drags down the whole solar sector. From New York, I'm Alex Steele with my co-host in London, Guy Johnson. Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. Um, Guy, obviously there's somewhat of a risk off headed into the weekend. And then under the hood, there's some really powerful uh, earnings movers within the S&P from regional banks to Solar Edge. That's the micro yep. story right now. That solar edge story making me feel very dark. The sun seems to have vanished from the sky, um, certainly in that sector. But I think more broadly, look, I think the only thing you can take away from today is that everybody's hunkering down a little bit into the weekend. Stocks are off, bonds are bid. The, the UK 30-year was, was on offer a little bit earlier on. But I think broadly, the sentiment certainly at the front end is that you're looking for a place to hide out. That gold story absolutely yeah. front and centre on that. So I, I'm not sure there's anything we can take away. But I think on the week... On the week, it's a different matter. On the week, sentiment is getting pretty bad out there. And, and, I, and I hear what Hartnett is saying at Bank of America. Is this, are we at the point now where you can sort of start to dip your toe in because of that negativity? I don't know. You talk to a lot of people out there. They're very bearish. Is yep. there more bear, are, are there more bears to come? I mean, it's possible, but I have to say, looking into the weekend, Guy, I'm excited because you're going to get in on a plane on Sunday morning to come to New York. You'll be in the studio right next to me. The floor crew right now is doing this. Um, very excited uh, to have you here all next week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'm looking forward to it. Look, we've got a, we've got a great Monday lined up. I, I've got this theory, right? If you want to know what's happening in the world, and, and many of us do, there's a few people you want to ask. And the people you really want to ask are airline CEOs. Because if you think about it, airline CEOs, they know all about the oil price story at the moment. They know all about the consumer trend story. They know all about corporate spending. Uh, they know all about the supply chain story. They know all about the geopolitics. Basically, if you want to know what's happening, ask an airline CEO. And on Monday, we are going to do just that. We've got these two in the studio, Shai Weiss, Ed Bastian, Virgin Atlantic CEO, Delta Airlines CEO. It is going to be a great conversation. Will, be any, will, we, will we be any of the wiser at the end of it? I suspect so. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. You're looking forward to it. And because you did the promo, I'm going to do the question of the day. We're just going to go to it. Because that's sort of the, the outlook that we're going to get on Monday. Right now, we're going to go to that Bank of America note that Michael Harnett had out, which is, is sentiment bad enough now to buy the dip? And you can make the argument whether it's for bonds or whether it's for equities. Bloomberg's Liz McCormick and Abigail Doolittle join us now. Um, Abigail, I'm going to start with you because you also look at the charts and technicals. And I'm wondering, when you look at RSI, you look at sentiment, what do you think? Is sentiment bad enough to buy? Uh, I don't think so. I'm kind of surprised by the finding of this survey. And if you were to define different measures of sentiment, whether it's the VIX, whether it's dispersion and correlations or the charts, the S&P 500 is not even down on its 200-day moving average yet. The Russell 2000 right now down 13%. The Russell, the S&P 500 from its July high is down just about 7%, still above the 200-day moving average. So I think we need to see more selling. Now, for a longer-term sell-off, you also want to bring in a capitulation idea. You want to bring in credit, CDS. You also want to bring in bonds, some kind of a haven rally. So right now, for a near-term dip buying opportunity, maybe for like a week or two, maybe, but for longer term, I don't think so. I think there's a lot more selling to go. Liz, happy Friday. How's the sentiment? Yeah, I mean, I know we like uh, banter back and forth, but I, I would lean towards Abigail's uh, sentiment, too, that I think the sentiment, like you said, Guy, isn't great. People are feeling stressed, worried. There's so many issues around the globe. But I don't think people feel confident enough to buy the dip, whether like Abigail is mostly talking about stocks, but even in bonds, unless you go very short and very haven. Uh, and we did see some money come out of money market funds yesterday. So mm -hmm. that shows maybe people are, like you say, guy dipping their toes into other things. But, I mean, look at the volatility in the rates market, the bond, long bond yields, everything, like you said, yields are down today. But you just kind of can't figure. One day they're down, and then we're seeing double-digit increases. Yeah. So I don't think people want to buy duration. That's not quite like the capitulation in the bond market enough, even though it's been brutal, to kind of step in. 
Yeah, fair enough. I, I wonder though, and this was sort of in the note, Michael Harnett talked about this, it kind of removes though some upside. So this is obviously to stocks list, but uh, if the index can't hold at 4,200, so we are trading somewhere, hold on, I probably should have pulled that up before I started this. So we're trading at 4,261, then with this level of bearishness and there may be imminent risks of a credit event uh, or hard landing. So Abigail, I'm just gonna go with you on this one because I found that quite interesting too, that maybe it doesn't mean buy the dip, but it does definitely cap upside. Uh, yeah, I think it would cap upside in a lot of ways in terms of buying the dip. I mean, I think that there's a lot of different things going. I think that investors are on warning that there could be some worse selling ahead. And that is that idea of that capped upside that you're talking about relative to the S and P 500. I think that it's pretty clear that, uh, we could go from a technical perspective and again, going below the 200 day moving average, we could go down to 3,900 on the uncertainty of that. Will Liz was talking about, um, you know, mm -hmm. if we bring in, uh, you know, the geopolitical tensions, uh, the consumer, but I think that the thing that's really going on here is this weird tension between, uh, the fed and bond traders. So here you have, or I should say bond traders as the haven, because you have the fed clearly supporting yields going higher. At least that's my view of the situation. Uh, so for us to see some haven, uh, Buying. There has to be a real risk off event capitulation. The VIX has started to go into backwardation, which is a way of saying that the current VIX is uh, higher than further out. So people are really worried about the, the near the here and now. Once that situation becomes worse at that point, that might be some, uh, you know, a buy the dip type of situation. But yeah, there does seem to be a cap in terms of how high right now uh, stocks could go. Liz, how bad do you think sentiment is? I, I, I'm going to park the bond market to one side for the moment because I think the bond market is dealing with other issues at the moment. So let's ignore the bond market. But I look at the Swiss franc and I look at gold. Gold's rising in a rising yield environment, which is completely counterintuitive. That shouldn't be happening. The dollar's also reasonably strong as well, so that shouldn't be happening either. How big a signal, how big a tell is gold giving us, do you think, right now on how beaten up sentiment really is? Yeah, and I think, um, you know, if you read Eddie Vanderwalt's with our M Live crew, he's done some good stuff saying that if you kind of factor out, like you're getting at, Guy, where gold should be given rates and other things, there's even more of a premium in gold, you know, than you see just in the price in front of your screen. So I think there is enough, you know, fear and sentiment because, like, let's all be humble. And I think, you know, so the smartest people, you know, say that, even at the Fed, that we don't know. Like, you don't know where the inflection point is going to be in the market. So you have to start hedging, you know, buying things like gold, dipping your toes into haven stuff, even though, you know, things are not working right, like we talked about the bond market. Like, even long-term investors, you just don't know. So you, you have to kind of, like, just be careful. So I think you're right. Sentiment is souring. I mean, to me, the key thing is people will keep spending as long as they have jobs, right? So it comes back to the labor market cracking. So you, you're not feeling as good, but if, if you have an income, you're still kind of spending and keep, can keep up. So I think it comes back to the Fed's focus that if the labor market starts to crack, then sentiment mm -hmm. is going to even get worse than it's been dipping to. Um, Abigail, I also want to talk about micro for a second because we also got earnings out bunch of different places, but particularly I want to talk about the regionals because they're getting hit really hard, mm -hmm. um, particularly on regions financial mm -hmm. where they disappointed. And we're kind of waiting for more cracks to spread. And, and, and the punishment we seem to be getting when there's a miss seems to be quite extreme. What do you make of that? Well, I think folks are really on edge because of what happened earlier this year, this idea that something broke, that something could break more. Plus, we have the commercial real estate situation. The most were, uh, there's, I believe it's, I forget the exact number, but many trillion dollars worth of mm -hmm. CMBS come due by the end of 2025. Most of it spread out amongst those regional banks. But the idea that some of these regional banks, that the deposits are a little bit lower than expected, I think investors are just worried. They don't want to get caught up in, say, a Silicon Valley. Right, I don't think it's unlikely, but I think that that's like a sign of the times. Right. So it's just more like you just don't want to hold that risk versus mm -hmm. yes, exactly. a strong opinion necessarily in Regions Financial. Um, all right, guys, thanks a lot. It's going to be a lot to get through here. Bloomberg's Liz McCormick and Abigail Doodle, thank you both very much. So coming up, we're going to get more insight into our question of the day. Is sentiment bad enough to buy the dip? So Steve Sosnick, Interactive Brokers Chief Strategist, joins us next. This is Bloomberg.
Bloomberg's Guy Johnson and Alex Steele sit down for an exclusive interview with Virgin Atlantic CEO Shai Weiss and Delta CEO Ed Bastian. The health of airline companies, the future of business travel, and headwinds facing the industry. Tune in October 23rd at 11.30 a.m. Eastern, 4.30 p.m. London time on Bloomberg Television. Context changes everything. The Fed's job is to control prices, you know, price stability and full employment. But they have a third mandate, and that's market stability. And the move index tells us that it's not stable. So I think we're going to drop on a forced technical move if Treasury auctions fail and there aren't buyers. That was Mark Connors, 3IQ Corp uh, head of research, speaking to Guy and I uh, yesterday, being a mean guy yesterday, and he was basically saying that the move in the move index would be the equivalent to the VIX at 50. That's a really strong move there. So well, let's take a look at some of the market technicals, especially as it relates to volatility. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle joins us now. Abigail? That is a really strong move. That would be very extreme because right now we have the VIX at 21. But I have to say the VIX at 21, the VIX is finally waking up because we've had the VIX this year for the most part below 20. If you go back historically, the VIX, a normal level that suggests normal uh, fear and greed for the market, somewhere right around 20. But in recent years, and there have been exceptions, we have had the VIX well below 20. So the fact that it's back above 20, that suggests that investors are waking up to risks out there, uncertainty, whatever whatever it might be, fear of recession, geopolitical, uh, the Fed. But something else is happening. We actually have the VIX curve going into backwardation, which means that the uh, VIX futures, November and December, are a little bit lower than the VIX itself, suggesting investors think that right now might be a little bit more dangerous, if you will, a little bit more uncertain, a little bit more fearful than the future, which is typically not how it should be, only because we should have more certainty right now. Now, if we bring in dispersion and correlations, because of course, there's been a lot of talk about how low they were, uh, which makes it a stock picker's market. Well, they are on the rise. This is a little bit busy. These are two of the SIBO uh, indexes. What we're looking at here in white is uh, the one month correlation and then, then orange, the dispersion index. And you can see the dispersion index really actually I think that's reversed. You can see that they're both on the rise, pointing to more of a macro story around the markets that investors are a little bit more concerned together. And then finally, if we wrap this together with the VIX and the S&P, 500. What might it mean? Up top, this is the S&P 500. Down here is the VIX. The VIX has, for the most part, part uh, been below that 20 level, but you can see that there's over the last few years been between 20 and 30. The S&P 500's range, well, it's somewhere between, let's call it 3,700 and 4,500. Coming off the top, Alex, the VIX is starting to go back into that range, suggesting that right now might not be the time to buy the VIX or buy the S&P 500, that uh, there could be some more work to the upside for the VIX and volatility and to the downside for stocks. Abigail, really appreciate that setup. Thanks a lot, Abigail Doolittle. All right, that brings us to the question of the day, and I think that Abigail said would say the answer to this is no, but is sentiment bad enough to buy the dip? Here with us now, Steve Sosnick, Interactive Brokers Chief Strategist. Steve, always good to chat with you. Is sentiment bad enough to buy the dip? I think it depends. I think it depends on the mar on the asset class. I was I would, I'm not a bond expert, but I was out with some you know bond portfolio managers the other night, and they were finally begrudgingly admitted five percent, begrudgingly admitting that five percent on the ten year. Yeah, maybe maybe it's worth taking a shot. Maybe it's worth dipping your toe in because they have fallen so far so fast, and the mood stinks. Equities, I'm not quite so clear. I mean, yes, Abigail was just talking about the backwardation in VIX, um, but that. It tells me, well, you're a commodities person. When you, when you have a future that's normally in contango, it means that it's typically in plentiful supply. When that contango future flips to backwardation, it means the commodity in question is in short-term mm -hmm. supply. There's a, there's a short-term excess of demand over supply. In this case, the commodity in question is demand protection, I'm sorry, volatility protection offered by VIX. So after sort of months of relentless volatility selling uh, by, by institutions and individuals, all of a sudden they're caught a little they're caught a little bit off sides. But but as she was saying, we're not it, it, an inversion is mm -hmm. a necessary condition for a, for a bounce, but not a sufficient condition for a bounce. Steve, a, I'm sure a night nice out with the bond guys. That <laughs> sounds like a real giggle. <laughs> Um, They're more fun than you think. He's probably hungover. Is what's happening? I'm sure. It's, I'm sure it's. I'm sure it's a fun night out. Um, the, the second thing is, what would it take to get all? What would it take to get stocks all moving in the same direction? At the moment, what we've got is um, stocks moving in lots of different directions, and you can see it on a daily basis. Index goes nowhere. Single stocks go all over the show. 
What would it take? What kind of move, what kind of catalyst could we see to get stocks all moving in a single direction, be it up or down? Well, the, the answer to the down question, Guy, is, is much simpler. If, if, if the market's love of those seven stocks evaporates, well, then the gra you know, gravity takes hold and there's mm -hmm. really no choice. I, I think if you, if you really can get the sense that the economy is very strong or that the Fed has reversed course, you know, good luck with both of those right now, but that, that yeah. would turn around sentiment on the positive side, and then you would get perhaps some rotation into the, into the unloved 493 other stocks in the S&P 500. Um, yeah. It, it looks like today, though, all of them are getting kind of hit. Like, it feels like this could wind up being one of those really ugly days where you're just going to sell into the weekend, et cetera. Um, where do you think that there's still more selling pressure to legitimately be had? We were talking about small caps having already gotten beat up a lot, but Abby, I'm making the point that we can still get beat up even more. What, what do you think? Well, I think, you know, Tesla's, the reaction to Tesla yesterday was not at all helpful because mm -hmm. the, you just, we, you know, we started to take out one of the seven. I wouldn't say we take it out of the mix entirely, but, you know, if that starts to narrow to Magnificent Six, Magnificent Five, Magnificent Four, um, you know, fabulous, fantastic four, whatever you want to call it, 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 it starts to get really nasty, you know, so we've already experienced narrow leadership. And I think that, I think we need sort of the conditions to, to improve to such that, that people feel comfortable going home over the weekend. People feel comfortable owning the other stocks. It's an interesting phenomenon. 15 in a row, Mondays have been up, which tells you that a lot of the Friday, yeah. I haven't checked the Friday, not all the Fridays have been down, but a lot of those have been relief rallies that, okay, the weekend wasn't as bad as we thought on Friday. It, 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 Mondays have been up like 80% of the time this year, which is kind of odd. It's normally like 50 plus, 53% over time. Maybe it's not Happy Friday. Maybe it's actually Happy Monday. That's an inside joke within our team. <laughs> I don't believe in Happy Mondays. Um, let's, talk, let's talk about what's happening today. What's happening today? We've we got, we got a monthly expiry. Steve, do monthly expiries matter anymore? Yes. Um, they, they, the relative importance has diminished since we now have expiries every day. Um, and certainly for the most, yep. for the biggest stocks every week, uh, you know, for certain indices every day. But there's two things that are still unique about a monthly expiration. Number one, that is the AM expiring index options. And they do sort of, ex you know, put, have a gravitational pull um, on, on, on futures in the pre-market. And they really do set the tone for the day a lot of times. We didn't really get it this morning. We sort of settled down sort of between, between the, the levels where there were major um, expiring option positions. Um, so, but that, that's always one to keep an eye on. The other thing to keep in mind is on monthly expirations, every stock has zero DTE options. The whole point about zero dated options are yep. that they're expiring. Well, on expiration, they're all expiring. And so that's really the, that's really the nature of it. Um, you, know, it you know, we talk about, when we talk about zero dated options or weekly options, it's not that anything's fundamentally changed, it's just that the expiration cycle has compressed. Mm -hmm. um, but for the vast majority of, of stocks, that, that expiration cycle still remains um, we, monthly. And so it does still matter. Steve, thanks a lot. We really appreciate it. Steve's the guy that you call when the markets don't make sense, basically. And be like, <laughs> what's going on today, Steve? Steve Sosnick of Interactive Brokers. Thank you very much. All right, still ahead, we are now headed into big tech earnings for next week. We got through Netflix, we got through Tesla, and now it's the big guys for next week. We're going to break down what to look for next in the startup. This is Bloomberg. It is 22 past 7 on the West Coast. We want to get to the startup. We cover the top tech stories from the Bay Area and beyond. Silicon Valley starts its morning. Joining us now, Bloomberg Technology co-host Ed Ludlow. Ed, I'm trying to think of something creative about like clouds over San Francisco, yeah. clouds of Tesla, clouds for big tech. Uh, when it comes uh, to next week, what we get? Microsoft, right? Amazon? I mean, the list goes on. It's kind of a weird situation because we go into this quarter's earnings with everyone pinning their hopes on big tech. You know, we did this fantastic Tech Watch column last week about how if you look at the five mega caps, their average earnings growth is projected to be like 34 percent because we started the year with the pain with tens of thousands of jobs being cut and cost discipline. And the results are now going to show in those names you see on the screen, many of them, maybe apart from Intel, uh, where they're just profit machines at a time where the S&P 500 yeah. as a whole is projecting flat earnings growth. But the, the thing is, Guy, like, what, what if we're wrong and tech doesn't do as well on a bottom line perspective this as we is, think This they is will? the story. Mm -hmm. Look, if the famous five do not deliver next week, all hell famous is going to break loose, I think. 
Like this is this is this is the moment for the market. This is what has supported the market. If these guys aren't delivering, then that is a major piece of the foundation that is under pressure. Yeah, and there's also a lot of contradictory data and reporting out there, right? So if we take Apple as a case study, from a top line perspective, Apple's revenue is uh, forecast to drop 1% year on year in the quarter. That would be the fourth straight quarter of, of sales declines, which Apple hasn't seen for two decades. And we had that third party data saying that sales of the iPhone 15 in China are not looking good relative to the same period a year ago when they released iPhone 14. So even if they do, you know, the traditional Apple thing of just being brilliant at, at, at eking out profit, psychologically, mm -hmm. we're worried about tech because we learned with Tesla this week, right? Um, no matter how charismatic your leader is or how brilliant your product, there is no sort of blanket immunity to the world around you. But what I find so interesting when we kind of lump all these companies together is that they are very different stories, right? Like Amazon yeah. has the retail component, and I get that, but it's also cloud. Uh, it's the same with Microsoft, the same with Google. That's not the story for Apple uh, and Intel in the same way. Like we're going to lump them in, which I appreciate, but there's the idiosync yeah. idiosyncratic issues here. Yeah, and, and, you know, go back a quarter, you know, one quarter doesn't make a company's entire year, but... And the cloud story is really interesting, right? Uh, usually when macro conditions are poor, you will see companies pull back on their cloud spend. The wild card is artificial intelligence and the sort of just clamor to secure uh, high level compute to, to power and, and train large language models. That, that's driven really big demand for the GPUs. We know that about Nvidia, although that story started to tail yep. off as well. So we might be wrong. Ed, what about advertising? I think this is going to yeah. be fascinating. What is happening with the consumer, the labor markets, it all comes together in so many ways within the advertising space. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, we, we look first of all to Alphabet, the parent company of Google, and then we go back to Meta probably and, and ask, you know, partly because they follow sequentially in the calendar. And often when Alphabet reports earnings, if it's good, you will see optimism going into Meta earnings because despite the story of the metaverse, their bread and butter is advertising. Um, I think, you know, there is some optimism. Um, the, the U.S. economy in particular continues to defy uh, the Federal Reserve's wishes, at least with strong data, particularly consumer facing. And so there is some, some read through on the sell side, at least, that we might see some, yep. some strength toward the end of the year in ads. You look at that, that retail sales number that we got earlier on. Amazing. Ed, looking forward to the coverage. You guys are going to set us up perfectly, I know, for next week. You and Caroline. Ed Lover, Caroline Hyde, Bloomberg Technology, coming up in around 90 minutes time. Coming up on this show, we're going to turn our attention to what is happening in the Middle East. We're going to talk about gold. Suki Cooper is going to join us. This is Bloomberg. We're about an hour into a pretty ugly trading session on very high volume. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle tracking those moves. Abigail? Yes, yeah, stocks are down for a fourth day in a row. So this is the weekly move, and you can see it's pretty brutal. The S&P 500 down 1.9%, the NASDAQ 100, and the NYSE Fang Index both down more than 2%. Uh, the move that really stands out here to me, and a big piece of why stocks are down the first down week in three weeks and the worst week in three weeks, take a look at the 10-year yield on the week backing up 32 basis points, and we're off the highs. So uh, at the highs, probably closer to 40 basis points in five days. That's the degree of uh, repricing of risk bond traders are seeing, finally believing that the Fed is saying what they've been saying for a year and a half, uh, that they are in hiking mode, they're staying there, and they're making sure that inflation is not going to have a reemergence uh, like the 1970s. Now, if we put this into the picture of credit, the S&P 500, this is the SPY here in white and yellow and blue, we're looking at uh, two of the bond ETFs. Yellow is LQD, corporate bond ETF, and then uh, uh, blue is the junk uh, ETF. Let me make sure that I have that right. Actually, LQD, the corporate bond ETF, is the one that's actually down on the year. The fact that you have these credit indexes, uh, ETFs down, with the S&P 500 higher may suggest that today is not or right now is not a buy the dip moment, that there's more work to the downside for all of these risk assets. There is a treasury component in both of those credit ETFs, but nonetheless, it's bearish. As for what's weighing on uh, the S&P 500 today, Oracle is down. Uh, this has to do with uh, disappointment over an AI event. American Express uh, numbers, while they put up record profit, the growth not quite there. Amazon and JP Morgan both down as well. But one bright spot, let's take a look at it. 
over the last two weeks. There's more than this, I'm sure, but one bright spot for sure is gold. Take a look at gold uh, up 8.5% over the last two weeks, back above 2,000. Wow, I'm not sure the last time it was at 2,000, Guy, uh, but this is, again, one bright spot, and probably the fact that this haven's going higher may be suggesting it's not a buy-the-dip moment. Yeah, I think we I think we bottomed out on the uh, on the sixth, I think sixth of October, and then we've rallied really hard since then. Um, Abigail, thank you very much indeed. Gold is a fantastic story uh, to look at right now. In some ways, it's totally counterintuitive. You've got rising yields that shouldn't be good for gold. You've got a strong dollar that shouldn't be good for gold. Yet gold is rallying. Gold's rallying, you could argue, therefore, because of that safe haven trade. Suki Cooper, Executive Director for Precious Metals Research, joins us now from Standard Chartered. Suki, is gold the right place to hide? Is there more to come? I, the bounce has been quite strong. Do you think we're done yet? We saw a lot of those macro headwinds starting to build and we were starting to look like we were going to get a retest of that 1800 level. But yes, it's been the resurgence in safe haven buying that has buoyed prices higher. What we tend to see when we have heightened geopolitical risks is that we have an initial rally as we see a move into the safe haven assets and the safe haven appeal. Um, but thereafter, we tend to see that move tends to fade. Mm -hmm. We saw a very similar price reaction um, when um, Kuwait was invaded as well. We, and we're, prices are currently trending at a very similar level um, to back then as well. I, I'm, Suki, it's great to see you. I should point out that you're looking at the gold futures contract for December. Spot gold is still at 1990, so not at that 2000 yet, but you can definitely see it getting there. Uh, Suki, great to see you. If I look at the curve, are, are we actually going to get backwardated here? Like, there's been a real re-rating right at that front end uh, in, in, in the last, like, month or so. Is that a possibility? If we see the gold market uh, moving into a backward-dated market, it tends to be short-lived. Ultimately, it's still the drivers around the macro factors that tend to be key in terms of the backwardation of the curve. So we're looking at the interest rates here. And currently, we should still continue to see a positive yield. So if we do see a backward-dated curve, we think it's most likely going to be short-lived. Suki, who do you think is actually buying? Who, who, who's driving this right now? This is a really interesting dynamic in the market at the moment. We're not seeing ETF uh, holders coming into the market. In fact, we've continued to see huge net redemptions, and that has continued over the past week, even when we've seen this huge move in prices upwards. In fact, what we saw initially last week was short covering activity in terms of tactical investors, but towards the end of last week, we started seeing fresh long positions being established. So the latest data when it comes out this week will be key to track whether that momentum has continued. We're also entering a physically strong period for the gold market, a seasonally strong period for consumption. Mm -hmm. So if we were had market we had price dips, we might have seen that buying come back. But central banks continue to remain strong buyers here as well. Um, why do you think that ETF gold buyers have been selling and not buying in this environment? This is a really interesting dynamic when we look at the flows. One of the analysis that we like to look at is the price points where ETF holders establish those positions. And we're not in loss-making territory at the moment. If prices dip below 1,800, we get another 100 tons that becomes loss-making, extra pressure to the downside. But at these price levels, one would look, be looking to be buying the dips, especially if you're looking to rethink the purpose of your portfolio, if you're looking for a safe haven asset and you're looking for a diversifier. But instead, the appeal of higher interest rates elsewhere, equity market performance elsewhere, has really weighed on the gold market. And as Guy mentioned, some of those key factors, the stronger dollar, high interest rates, have also capped gold's upside. Suki, is gold the right metal to own? Do I want to own silver right now? Do I want to own gold? Do I want to own some of the other precious metals? How should, you be, how should we be thinking about which metals we want to own at the moment. Gold's the, the kind of the most obvious one, but is it the best one? It depends on which period we're looking at here. In the short term, gold, we think that could be exposed to further upside risk. But we think that the geopolitical premium that's been priced at the moment is likely to be short-lived. Mm -hmm. But beyond this going into the back end of 2024, that's when we think that we're more likely to see upside risk for gold materialising, when we see confirmation that the Fed is likely to cut rates and interest rates around the world are likely to start to ease. But if we're looking across the entire complex, we're seeing some huge diverging trends at the moment, whether it's a palladium market which is set to move into a surplus on a, on a serial basis, going into 2024 and beyond, whereas in contrast, metals like platinum and silver are more exposed to 
industrial demand growth driven by green energy and mm -hmm. battery electric vehicles. So we'd say on a fundamental basis, platinum is perhaps the one that looks like it has the most upside risk if we're moving beyond 2024 and into 2025, 2026, when we anticipate larger deficits for that market. But in the short term, gold is perhaps the market we need to be keeping an eye on, especially with its safe haven appeal. Uh, Suki, we um, had the data on um, uh, what China was doing with treasuries. And I'm wondering, as, they, as China needs to support its currency, et cetera, does gold get wrapped into that? Like, are they going to have to sell their gold holding to support their currency? I mean, the thesis 10 years ago for gold was that, hey, we're going to have a lot of central bank buying. Is that still the case? What's been interesting about the China market is that we've seen buying on almost firing on all cylinders, whether it's um, retail investment demand, whether it's jewelry demand, whether it's central bank buying, all end usages at the moment look quite strong. But of course, we're coming off quite a weak base from last year and the year before in terms of that retail appetite. But we are seeing a rebound in local interest um, in the gold market, whether that's on the back of concerns around um, the economy, uh, the economic growth not being as strong as what was anticipated at the start of the year, or whether that's concerns around other asset classes. But the fact that we've seen China's imports remaining strong in excess of 100 tons mm -hmm. um, for the bulk of the past year suggests that that demand growth, that that demand appetite is still very much there. Suki, thanks so much. It's been so long. Suki Cooper, Executive Director for Precious Metals Research at Standard Charter Bank. Thank you so very much. Nonetheless, Guy, when you're taking a look at sort of the safe haven bid, whether or not it lasts for a short or a long period of time, you're still looking at that 2000 if you're looking at December futures and 1990 uh, if you're looking at spot. I guess the question is, it just becomes expensive to store that stuff with yields high, so that kind of takes away some of the attraction yeah. at the same time. It, it, it's, it's, you've got, it's a commitment. If you're not buying it through the ETFs and you're buying physical gold, it is obviously a huge commitment that you're making. So this is not something that you can get in and out of relatively easily. So I think that's worth bearing in mind. I just find it fascinating that gold's rallied with so many of the headwinds against it. As Suki yeah. said, though, if, you, if we get to the point where the Fed says we're done and that, that kind of headwind from rising rates starts to dissipate, that, I, you, you could see a definite move on the back of that. But on the other hand, you've got to kind of, I guess, factor in the fact that we're, we're looking at rising yields regardless right. almost of what is happening with the Fed, which complicates matters. Which also just raises the question of cross-asset correlation and if that makes sense. Um, I was reading earlier in the week that with the rise we've seen in, in the bond market in terms of yields, the dollar maybe should be higher or the dollar move should be higher than it has been yep. if you look at just straight up rate differentials and it hasn't. So, like, can we really use those cross-asset valuations? Not sure. Not sure. It, I, I, incredibly complicated market to navigate, yep. I think, at the moment, which is why everybody's, even, even institutional money, leaving for the sidelines. See ya. Yep. You can deal yep. with this later. I'm going into cash. Yep. Uh, yeah, but that was a great point. A money market funds retail staying in, but institutional investors getting out of those money market funds. Anyway, speaking of, uh, we're going to talk about ETFs. So new ETFs are riding on the coattails of Tesla's famous volatility. You definitely saw that with earnings this week. We're going to have some details on that. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets. You are looking at live pictures of the principal room. Coming up, Kate Moore, BlackRock's head of thematic strategy, joins Bloomberg TV at 3 p.m. New York Times. She's wonderful. This is Bloomberg. It's time now for ETF Friday, and this week we're taking a look at a newly launched ETF that offers investors two times the returns of Tesla's vol vol volatile stock, if you want it. Uh, joining us now with more details is Bloomberg's cross-asset reporter Emily Griffeo. I mean, Tesla's volatile enough as it is, sure, okay, but how do these ETFs work? Well, they have proved to work in the past. This is the first of its kind. We have 2x leveraged Tesla from the issuer Rec Shares, and they also launched a 2x inverse oh my Tesla. So if you want to short Tesla in a major way, you can also buy that fund. This is the first time that we're seeing the SEC actually allow a double leverage 
leveraged single stock ETF. There are hmm. ways to do double or triple leverage um, indexes, but this is the first time they've actually allowed it for a single stock. Um, previous years, uh, issuers had tried to launch these products and they hadn't been able to get it through. So we'll have to see. We asked the um, issuer, like, how did you actually make this work? And it's unclear what they did to assuage the SEC's concerns about volatility, but now they're launching. Emily, who is this aimed at? Where's the appetite coming from? I, I think it's really aimed at retail investors and other kinds of investors who want to ride Tesla's volatility. There's actually a ton of single stock leveraged 1.5 uh, ETFs on the market, but the only ones that are actually getting inflows are ones that are really tied to yeah. Tesla. Um, so we're seeing one uh, 1.5x Tesla ETF has grown to $1 billion in assets in just a year, which is a huge growth rate for uh, these kinds of ETFs. So I think this speaks more to the appetite that investors in the ETF marketplace have to ride the Tesla volatility than trying to buy some type of leveraged or mm -hmm. derivatives-based ETF. How do we understand this in relation to other products like the Spot Bitcoin ETF? Like I just... It, it strikes me as odd, knowing as little as ETFs as I do, that like that they would approve these things, but then not a Bitcoin e ETF, right? Like, didn't we learn anything from when the 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 volatility of the VIX ETNs like took out everything a couple years ago? You are voicing the same concerns that a lot of spot Bitcoin ETF hopefuls have, because the SEC not only have they approved this 2x Tesla, but they've actually also approved a 2x. Bitcoin futures ETF. What? So uh, I think a lot of my sources at least are saying, if the SEC is really here to protect retail investors, how have they approved 2x Bitcoin futures and not a spot? That's really the big question right now. Will we or will we not? At least in this case, this is a product that the SEC has voiced concerns about, and now they've let it through when it comes to 2x Tesla. So perhaps this bodes well for, you know, they've voiced concerns about spot Bitcoin. Maybe they're changing their tune, but we have to see. We're all waiting for that moment. I suspect the, the Venn diagram overlap between kind of single day options and some of these ETFs mm -hmm. might be quite interesting. Great stuff, Emily. Fantastic to see you on a Friday, every Friday. Emily's here, ETF Friday. Emily Grafea, thank you very much indeed. Um, so I understand, Alex, that there's, there's shopping going on. Okay. Is, is this true or not? It was Christmas shopping and there were very good deals. So I am still technically in my budget. Okay. Can I relate this to the Amex numbers today? Uh, no, you can't. I mean, I have an Amex card, but clearly, I mean, I haven't been spending, but they still did okay. They did amazingly. I tell you what I find amazing about the Amex numbers is the fact that people are paying up for cards, the higher price cards, mm -hmm. and using those cards and the benefits that come with me. There's a lot being written at the moment about sort of the tyranny of subscriptions. Everybody, you've got a subscription for everything. And this kind of feels like this model as well. They, they give you more and more benefits. Are you getting value from those benefits? I think that's a, that's a confusing story or so, not. So uh, Caroline Maybe. sat down with the CEO of, of Amex, and these are some of the things that they talked about. Uh, and this was quite interesting. So I might be holding on to a budget, but apparently millennial and Gen Z now have more spending in the quarter than our baby boomers. We're going to be with them through their life's journey. The lifetime value of these cardholders gives us a lot of confidence in the future. Yeah. Now, there's always that tipping point guy, right? When are we worried that you have Gen Z millennials spending more on credit cards? Does that mean they're buying, like, food on credit cards? Or do they have the money to actually spend in their loyal customers? I don't know. I want to know what happened to Gen X in all of this, though. That's you and me. We got left out. Why yeah, I mean, I don't know. Our process? producer, Ann, just called me a boomer, so I don't know what that's about. But apparently a, I'm a baby boomer a, a and tough. I'm spending less. <laughs> that's tough. That's a tough go. <laughs> that, 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 that's that's, that's going to undermine your Friday a little bit. Yeah, um, I, I don't know. It's, it's the, You would have thought in some ways the baby boomers are in a good place right now because in theory they have very little debts and they've got high interest rates. Yep. So in theory, this should be working for them. But I guess portfolios at the moment are under quite a lot of pressure. There's losses in the bond market portfolios. There's increasing losses in equity portfolios as well. So I do wonder at some point whether or not that is going to hit spending from that particular cohort. Yeah. Well, apparently, we, on the other hand, yeah. we've, got, we've got all the bills right now. That's where, that's where all the bills show up, Generation X. Yeah, no kidding kids, the whole thing. Also, I should point out that the CEO had told Caroline that restaurants are the largest category right now. So if we do the whole, yeah. what is Alex buying? What is she not buying? Uh, we're going out to eat that more. Does fit. So it does fit with the Alex that trend. Does fit. Yeah. Though I hear there's, there, there are discounts available today. Alex has managed to resist those discounts. 
to a certain degree. I'm so strong. To I'm a so certain strong. degree. Anyway, coming up, PIMCO uh, snapping up debt last year at deep discounts. The banks were having to sell it. It bought it. Now it's beginning to get out of those positions. And there's a premium. We're going to have more details to follow. Shinali's going to be here. All Street Beat is next. This is Bloomberg. Time now for Wall Street Beat. We take a look at what's buzzing on Wall Street and the world of banking and finance. So today we're taking a look at PIMCO. So it bought some of the distressed debt from regional banks in the first quarter, maybe second quarter, and now it's able to sell off some of that, those hung loans for a premium. This is kind of the sweet spot for what we expected to happen. Bloomberg Shalai Basic can get us through the details. Shanali, walk me through it. So remember last year when the leveraged loan market really froze up when it came to acquisition financing. What happened was uh, the banks really were stuck with a lot of that hung debt. PIMCO was one of the ones to step in. Very few people really stepped in and bought some. They bought some, uh, particularly when it came to Worldline, the Apollo acquisition. They had bought the debt about 85 cents on the dollar, and they were able to offload it at 90 cents or more. The leverage loan market has really rebounded quite meaningfully if you take a look there. It has dipped more recently and so it has still been very volatile but some of these trades have worked out pretty spectacularly for fund managers who are willing to step into the fray late last year, early this year when the markets were really struggling when it came to offloading this debt. Shinali, who's buying? Who's buying? Other fund managers. What's interesting, too, is because you saw that uh, kind of chart there about how volumes and prices have really come back slightly here, but they have not rebounded fully. So you're still buying uh, debt at a discount to par. Okay. And so if you have a little uh, less risk appetite than, say, PIMCO did in the doldrums of last year, you still may be buying because if you expect them to recover fully, there's still some money to be clipped mm -hmm. from that discount there, Guy. Are the regional banks still in trouble, and do they need to offload more of the loans? Well, so a lot of those loans that we were talking about came from big-ticket M&A financing. But to your point here, these big funds are also looking at regional banks as well. So when we're thinking about the regional banking system, just take a look at today. The yes. pains are not over. Regions is having its worst day since March of 2020, uh, when you look intraday. And so there are some significant struggles, and that is not just because of the current third quarter outlook, or sorry, March of 2023. If, if you look on a, a closing period, it's March of 2020. But, you know, that, that March number was when you saw the worst of the banking crisis this year really come yeah. to the fore. Why is Regents doing so poorly? Because people are very worried here about the outlook for net interest margins. These are profitability questions, not uh, banking crisis questions right. again. And so in the private markets, there's a lot of questions on how they can come to the fore and really help these banks with their cost of funding and take some assets off their books to make it a little easier for them to weather this prolonged kind of storm. Shinali, what in particular, what's happening in commercial real estate there? Because what I keep hearing with commercial real estate is that the bid ask is still too wide to value this stuff. And therefore, I'm trying to understand how the banks, as they think about what they've got on their books, are going to do with it. Are they in a position now where they can value this stuff accurately enough to sell it? If there, if, what can they offload that, that you could price accurately and what can't they at this point? That question that you're asking is the same question I ask every private asset manager when I walk into a meeting. And it's because that clearing price is still so uncertain. And it's not just tied to commercial real estate guy. It's tied to all sorts of types of loan books. We had, for example, a conversation with Apollo about a month ago. And they had said, their deputy CIO of credit, said a lot of these bank loan portfolios are actually too expensive right now to buy. Uh, back when they did the PacWest trade, it was a lot cheaper for them to get in and provide a line of credit to uh, PacWest. But nowadays, there's so much demand from private asset owners that the prices are going up. So that clearing price may not be set yet, both for commercial real estate as well as other types of loan books. Charlie, great stuff as ever. Thank you very much indeed. Bloomberg, Charlie Bassack, and what's happening uh, with that banking story. Let's talk a little bit about what's happening with these markets right now. It has been an ugly week for European equities. We're down over 3%, 3.3% circa for the stock 600. We've broken through 440. We're now trading at 434. We're down by another 1.1% today. Every single sector this week is in negative territory if you take the last five days. The bond market's a bit of an... There's, there's a few anomalies in the bond market today. One of them is the UK 30-year. 
we moved up today to a level we haven't seen since 1998. 1998, pre-2000. This is absolutely amazing price action that we're seeing. Elsewhere, though, generally, the bond market has caught a bid today. The reason for that, we're going into a weekend. People are looking for that area for a little bit of safety, though bonds actually recently have not necessarily been the first port of call when it's come to that safety tray. You're looking at gold and other assets. You're also looking at the Swiss franc. Flat today but we continue to see a strong bid behind the Swiss franc. We're going to talk about that later on in, in the hour. We're going to be talking about what is happening there with the Swiss franc. We're going to be joined from Standard Chartered on that story, but we're also going to be joined to get a sense of where these markets are going more broadly, particularly European equities. Sebastian Regler, head of European equity strategy at Bank of America, is going to be joining us. They've got one of the most bearish outlooks on the stock 600 this year. We'll talk to Sebastian about where we go next. This is Bloomberg.